started, yeah? Terrific. Welcome. We have 115 people on the call. Expect more to join us. I'm Marcy Winter, Grad Coordinator of Code Pink Congress. I am so thrilled to be with you tonight and to be with our co-sponsors and co-hosts. Tonight's program, the U.S. and Iran, the Nuclear Deal and Beyond, is co-sponsored by Code Pink, Congress, Code Pink, also Massachusetts Peace Action, MAPA, and Roots Action, rootsaction.org. And on the screen, you see me, you see Brian Garvey, Cole Harrison, Hania Jodad Barnes, and Medea Benjamin. So here's the program for tonight. And then we're going to take a pause and, and check in with our hosts and receive some updates before we uh, move on to our speakers. Uh, our speakers tonight include Asal Rod. She's a researcher with, uh, with NIAC. Uh, and also, uh, we have. Um, Nigar Mortazavi, she has the Iran podcast. She's a journalist. And we're very interested in hearing the updates on what's going on with the Iran nuclear deal. This is the first in a series. We're so excited about this foreign policy series that we are doing jointly uh, tonight with Roots Action and Massachusetts Peace Action and going forward with Massachusetts Peace Action. And we are going to be looking uh, next the first and third Tuesdays of the month. Uh, we're gonna, our next one will be on the crackdown on Palestinian rights. We have some terrific speakers from NGOs, from Palestine Legal, the Center for Constitutional Rights against Canary Mission. Uh, after that, we'll be taking a look uh, in the beginning of March. Yes, in the beginning of March, we're gonna look at an update on Ukraine, which is so much in the news. And we'll be talking about that tonight as well in a minute. Uh, and we're going to hear from Larry Wilkerson, who used to be an advisor to Colin Powell and is now active in the peace movement, as well as Reiner Braun, who's a journalist in Europe. Uh, finally, we'll wrap up the series with what is the United States doing in Africa? And we'll hear from Dr. Gerald Horn, a professor of African-American history, and Maurice Carney, who is with Friends of the Congo, the executive director. So it, it should be an incredibly exciting series. With that, uh, let's check in with some of our other hosts. Cole Harrison, what's happening? Hey, Marcy, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I want to uh, thank Co Code Pink for Co and Roots Action for co-sponsoring the event with us tonight. We're very happy to do so. Mass Peace Action has been working on reconciliation with Iran for at least 14 years that I can trace back. Um, <clears throat> I've only been with the organization 11 years myself. Uh, but this is one of our deepest issues. And, um, you know, we certainly hope the Iran deal will uh, be restored and that the United States and Iran will actually reconcile their differences. Uh, Mass Peace Action is a state peace organization. We're an affiliate of Peace Action, which is um, a national peace membership organization. Uh, we are member governed and volunteer led. We have 1800 members in our state. And we have 10 different volunteer-led working groups, each of which have a different issue area that they pursue to work for peace. And I'll briefly run down nuclear disarmament, Middle East and forever, forever wars, Palestine, Israel, Latin America and the Caribbean, peace economy, no new cold war, climate and peace, fund healthcare, not warfare, racial justice and decolonization, and the Raytheon anti-war campaign. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Medea to give an update of what Code Pink is up to. Well, uh, wonderful. I'm just going to talk about my um, the things that I've been working on. One is the Ukraine. And I think we all know that this is a time where we've got to mobilize people. And it's been um, actually pretty good to see the response to the call for <laughs> getting people out on the street this Saturday. Uh, you can go to the codepink.org website and see what's planned in your community. And if there's nothing planned, then you are the one to plan it. Um, only need a couple of people and some good signs. Make your letters thick. Uh, it took me 20 years to learn that one. Uh, <laughs> and um, we have been encouraging people to continually uh, call the White House, contact their members of Congress, and I think we've had a lot of people doing that, which is good. Uh, we've also been in touch with our counterparts in Europe, and they are really mobilizing. 
I think they're better at it than we are in the UK, uh, Germany, and France. Uh, and so um, there is now a, a growing response. We uh, saw that there was a kind of a milk toast letter that the head of the Progressive Caucus, Pramila Jayapal and Barbara Lee put out, uh, and it wasn't signed by the members of the caucus. And there's almost a, a hundred members of that caucus. So we want that caucus to, to uh, be vocal. And, and we're saying, if you're a progressive, show it. And uh, part, you can't be a progressive and uh, be pro-war at this time in history. So um, there are uh, a number of progressives in that caucus that are actually signed on to horrific legislation that's calling for $500 million of new money to be going to Ukraine for lethal aid, i.e. weapons. And um, we are glad that folks in San Francisco, including our uh, Code Pink sisters and brothers, and any of you on the on the on this call, hope you'll join them. They're going to go uh, to um, uh, Nancy Pelosi's house because Nancy Pelosi is trying to fast track this uh, horrible legislation, which is not only calling for more money for Ukraine. But it, uh, for weapons for Ukraine, but it's also calling for draconian sanctions that would hurt the ordinary people of uh, Russia, just like these sanctions hurt so many other people around the world. So that's important stuff for you to do. And uh, we're really glad that many of you who are part of our, our liaisons uh, have been making those calls and hope you'll continue to do that and get out on the streets on Saturday. And thank you, Shay, for all the organizing that you've been doing on this. And uh, then just a, um, a, a aside as a positive note, I just got back from Honduras, where the that nation's first woman ever was elected as a president. And she also considers herself a democratic socialist. And she's got quite an agenda in front of her, but it's really exciting to see a fired up woman who wants to totally turn around the mess that is Honduras. And it's so interesting to see how she has leverage over the United States right now because the Biden administration is uh, probably, you know, one of its number one concerns is about immigration and how that's gonna affect the upcoming elections. And so they need this democratic socialist to succeed in Honduras. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very interesting uh, play of forces, and um, we hope that she will be successful in making some real changes in that small but very important Central American nation. So thank you. That's my update. Thank you, Medea. You are busy. We really appreciate it. And Medea was on Democracy Now! this morning, and if you didn't catch her, go to the website and watch. You were terrific. And, and we appreciate you calling for disbanding of NATO. Uh, with that, Brian Garvey, let's hear what's happening on your end. Thanks, Marcy. And I'm glad you just brought up uh, Honduras and, and the new possibilities that a new government being in charge uh, brings to that nation. One of the things that our Latin America and Caribbean working group has been focusing on is uh, opposing uh, the construction of a new hydroelectric project uh, that could endanger the waterways in, in Honduras. And we are hearing uh, that as a result of this election, um, that, that, uh, that program to build that dam on the Hilamito River uh, is now being paused. Um, so uh, a little ray of sunshine there, it's not done. Uh, we, we have to keep up the, the opposition uh, and keep working with, with Honduran land defenders. Uh, but the, the election of Castro is a, a very good sign uh, and, and gives us new possibilities. Um, another thing that I'm very excited about is a new network uh, of groups all across the country, uh, local and regional groups, um, that are protesting their local weapons manufacturers. These are the people who have won uh, from uh, endless wars over the last 20 years. These are the people who stand to gain uh, from $500 million in lethal aid uh, to Ukraine that's going to inflame that situation and that we all need to fight against. Um, so uh, Cole mentioned the Raytheon anti-war campaign. Um, that is our local coalition that, that fights the military industrial complex in our backyard uh, uh, here in the Boston area. But we've joined with groups from all across the country and we're going to, we've all committed to a week of action around tax day. 
uh, that focuses on how much of your federal tax dollars go to these companies and why the military budget uh, gets bigger year after year after year, even though the American people don't want that uh, and, and why our, our needs are not reflected um, uh, in the policies of Washington, D.C. Uh, we're also working on Yemen, uh, working with Danico of Red Code Pink uh, on this, as well as uh, folks from Action Corps, uh, the Yemeni Alliance Committee, um, on a day of action on March 1st to oppose the Yemen war. Uh, and we're also going to be making a lot of noise this Friday, because this Friday is the one-year anniversary of President Biden's speech at the State Department, where he promised to end the war in Yemen. But as I'm sure all of you know, uh, the war in Yemen continues and, and in some ways has intensified. Um, so our fight is not done uh, to stop our complicity in that war and our support for Saudi Arabia. Uh, and I'll just mention one last thing, uh, and that is on Valentine's Day, we're planning a day of action in solidarity with the people of Afghanistan. Uh, we supported the withdrawal of Afghanistan, but the sanctions and the freezing of assets that belong to the Afghan people are hurting uh, your average Afghanis, uh, mostly poor and working people. And, you know, it, there's a threat of, of famine and starvation. Um, so we're going to be standing in solidarity all across the country, uh, Peace Action Affiliates on Valentine's Day, uh, sending our love to Afghans and making a demand uh, that we unfreeze those assets and give that money back where it belongs. Thank you, Brian Garvey with Massachusetts Peace Action. Uh, we are gonna go to our, our next co-host in just a minute, but I, I do wanna emphasize that Code Pink is involved in organizing for February 5th, that's this Saturday, uh, demonstrations across the country to protest the shipping of hundreds of millions of dollars of weapons to Ukraine, as well as these uh, planned blanket sanctions that will hurt the, the uh, most vulnerable members of Russian society. So please do join a protest. You can find it at codepink.org. And there's another link that Shay will post in a minute uh, and sign up, either show up or uh, do, do uh, attend an event at another time and definitely call Congress. Uh, I'll put the switchboard in the chat, but we need no votes on these two bills to send all of these weapons to Ukraine. It's S3488 in the Senate, it's H.R6470 in the House. Bad, terrible bills, 41 Democratic co-sponsors in the Senate, shame on them, 13 in the House. All right. With that, I would like to introduce, proudly introduce a wonderful woman, a dear friend, Hania Jodad Barnes. She will be carrying a, a lot of the weight tonight as she co-hosts. Uh, Hania is the partnerships coordinator for Roots Action, one of the co-sponsors of tonight's event. She's a founding member of the Women's March LA. She was a 2020 DNC delegate for Bernie Sanders. That's when I first met Hania, and we have been very close ever since. And she is the interim vice chair of Progressive Democrats of America in California. She also has a young child, if you can believe it. She does all of that. Okay, Hania, you're on. Thank you so much, Marcy. I cannot put in words how honored I feel to be among um, such esteemed group of um, humanitarians. And, and when I found the opportunity to join this uh, uh, coalition with Roots Action, I was just, I felt so blessed. And... Uh, us at Roots Action, we um, have been working um, to urge the Biden administration, obviously, to join the JCPOA, rejoin the JCPOA, um, and we recently uh, launched a campaign um, urging that the sanctions also be lifted um, in collaboration with Dr. Sima Shahsari and Dr. Nikki Akhavan of No Sanctions on Iran campaign. Um, and as well as under the mentorship of uh, Asad Dr. Rod, um, uh, Roots Action has uh, put out a statement, which uh, Shay, if you could uh, share that with uh, our audience tonight, uh, as a call to defend human rights in Iran, um, which is a joint statement by Iranian American women and gender non-binary, uh, non um, addressing the impacts of um, sanctions on women, particularly, and uh, Iran's economy, and 
those women who have dedicated so much of their their life to fighting for a just society and and in human rights in Iran who can no longer organize because they simply need to feed their children. And um, so I think what's so important about this call and what I'm so delighted to see is we have um, two women who've been um, not only reporting the news, but I, I, Dr. Rod has been at the forefront of making sure that she is highlighting the injustices against the Iranian uh, uh, people. And so it is with my honor to introduce our very first speaker, um, Nagar Mortazavi, who is an Iranian American journalist and a political analyst and the host of Iran podcast, which I encourage for everyone to listen to and become a member. And she's based in Washington. She has been covering Iran's affairs and US-Iran relations for over a decade and a regular media analyst and commentator who has appeared on CNN, NBC, NPR, NPR BBC, France 24, and Al Jazeera. In 2021, she was featured in Forbes among 30 inspirational women who are breaking boundaries. She's also been named a young leader under 40 by New America Foundation in New York by the Middle East Policy Center in Washington and by Friends of Europe in Belgium. Uh, Nagar, if, hi. Okay, so great, we have you here and uh, please take it away. Tell us exactly what's being reported on JCPOA and take us through um, what we really need to look out for, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hania, for that uh, kind introduction and thanks to Code Pink and Roots Action and um, I believe Nayak who have hosted this very important and timely event. I was in fact just listening to Senator Menendez um, on the on the Senate floor, who was who still is, I believe, talking about uh, nuclear negotiations with Iran. He was giving a history of the JCPOA, and interestingly, even though Senator Menendez himself used to be a critic of the JCPOA, I believe he still is, but he criticized. President Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA on the Senate floor just a few minutes ago, which was interesting. Um, I'm going to go back and listen to that speech now. Um, so mm, I think your uh, members have been probably following the nuclear negotiations that are happening in Vienna. We are sort of in the middle of the eighth round. There's a break of the eighth round of negotiations. Uh, between the Biden administration and uh, the Iranian side. The first six rounds of negotiations in Vienna happened with the previous Iranian administration, the more moderate administration of Hassan Rouhani. And after the June presidential elections in Iran, uh, there was a change of administration. Uh, now the hardliners are in power in Iran with the ultra conservative president, Ibrahim Raisi. Um, the Iranians withdrew from negotiations for or paused their participation for a few months um, and then returned to what was the seventh round of negotiations with the Biden team. And uh, this round that we're sort of in the middle now is the eighth round of negotiations. We're hearing from um, various officials in the Iranian government. We've heard from American officials. We've We've seen reporting without the names of officials, but we've heard reporting from American officials. And we also hear from Europeans and especially the European Union. I see the European Union who is the facilitator, who has been the facilitator of these negotiations and diplomacy uh, since the times of the JCPOA. They had a very um, key role in helping the agreement happen and bringing sort of uh, the multiple sides together. And I still sort of see them as more of a neutral party uh, when it comes to uh, the US and Iran side. And we're hearing some urgent, but I think also more optimistic messages from these officials. Um, there was also reporting just this week, again, from both sides, that seems like um, a potential deal um, is, is now in sight because for a few months, I would say now for up to a year, it wasn't even sure. At some point, we were optimistic. When the Biden administration first started, President Biden had promised to re-enter the JCPOA. He had criticized uh, President Trump for withdrawing from the JCPOA. And um, myself and some other Iran watchers had been 
warning that there was a short window of opportunity with the previous administration, the more moderate team in Tehran. Um, but unfortunately, the deal didn't happen before June and it uh, sort of spilled over into the next administration. There was a five month delay and um, there was more of a pessimistic vibe to the negotiations, especially the first time the new hardline team came to negotiations with Iran as we expected. Um, with more maximalist demands, but now it seems like the two sides have been able to sort of bring themselves closer to each other, bridge the gaps, not entirely, but um, it seems like a potential uh, outcome is in sight now. So I'm just hoping that, um, well, it didn't really happen in the first year of the administration, but I'm just hoping that this is something that the president himself, because this is a very important political decision that President Biden himself has to invest in, he has to be behind this position, this um, political decision, just as President Obama was. And um, I think it's also a priority, it should be a priority, a foreign policy priority of the administration, because the alternative to diplomacy with Iran and to an agreement as we know, is going to be more conflict and military tension uh, that can potentially affect the entire region. It's not just going to be bound to US and Iran. So um, I think there has been serious diplomacy happening, especially in the past few months. And surprisingly, um, the Iranian side, even though they're the hardliners, but I call them hardliners 2.0, um, they seem to be sort of different from what we've had the memories of the previous conservative or hardline president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Um, and um, the overall decision making in Tehran seems to be to stay within the JCPOA. Iran hasn't left the JCPOA yet, even though the US is outside the JCPOA since President Trump left in 2018. Iran hasn't left the deal. They have reduced their compliance and expanded their nuclear program. Um, but I think the ultimate decision in Tehran so far is to stay within the JCPOA. And also reading Tehran, um, I think the nuclear program, still the decision is that the nuclear program remain a civilian program because we hear alarmist um, calls from the various anti-diplomacy circles that Iran is going for a bomb and the Russian for a nuclear weapon. Um, I don't see any indications that that's the political decision that Tehran has made. And um, I think they still want to continue to remain a civilian, to keep their uh, nuclear program a civilian program. And this is something um, the CIA chief has also recently um, uh, repeated that their US intelligence um, Observation also is that Iran's nuclear program remains civilian and there's no intent for rushing for a bomb. Um, with all said, I want to uh, make my remarks. I wanted to make them short and I'm happy to answer any questions from you or the audience. Um, but again, the JCPOA was a very, I think, rare and exceptional farm policy achievement, really the uh, one of the biggest legacies of the Obama administration. And it was very um, unlikely just a few years before, if you had asked Iran watchers for the US and Iran to come together, to negotiate directly, to for officials to appear in public together and all of that. And um, it's just that diplomacy is, is a very sensitive and um, very delicate um, matter. And I think the Biden administration has approached it with caution, but one um, criticism that I've had of the administration's approach is of time. I think there has been a long delay in a return to the JCPOA. This would have happened in the first few months of the administration. This is something that's completely within the powers of the president. The uh, withdrawal from the JCPOA happened with a presidential um, executive order. It and the return to the JCPOA can also happen with an executive order. And um, I think it's something that President Biden should really prioritize and put his political force behind to make it happen.
Well, I'm most certainly glad to, to hear that there is uh, an opportunity for both sides to come to an agreement. But we also has been reported that um, there is a bit of a turmoil um, in Robert Malley's team with Richard Nephew stepping down as the deputy special envoy uh, for Iran, which I'd like to get into that um, uh, and, and have you give us an update on why this is happening. If there is, in fact, optimism uh, you know, on, on both sides, then why are people leaving the team? Uh, but before uh, we go into uh, q and I'd like to introduce our next guest. And thank you so much, Nagar, um, for that wonderful uh, your, your words, wonderful remarks. Um, always good to hear you speak uh, on this issue. Uh, our next speaker, who I am just a huge fan of, and I bother her quite often with questions, and we're constantly chatting, and she has been uh, a great mentor to me, and, a, and a, someone I'd like to call my sister, um, Dr. Asal Rod, who has her PhD in Middle Eastern History from the University of California, Irvine. Her doctorate focused on modern Iran with an emphasis on national identity formation and popular culture in post-revolutionary Iran. Dr. Rod joined the National Iranian American Council in 2019 as a senior research fellow, um, and she works on research and writing related to Iran policy issues and U.S.-Iran relations. Her writing can be seen in Newsweek, The Independent, Foreign Policy, Mondo Wise, and more. She has appeared as a commentator on BBC World, BBC Persian, and Al Jazeera. And I would really highly recommend for everyone, I'll share um, both uh, Dr. Rod and um, uh, Negar's uh, uh, Twitter handle, so you can all follow them and get the day-to-day -day updates. Uh, Dr. Rod, please take it away. Thank you, Hania, for the very, very kind and generous introduction as always. And of course, to everybody who's here you know, tonight, spending your evening, uh, listening to us and having what, you know, obviously uh, those of us who are involved in this area think is a very important conversation to have. Um, I think, you know, Negar presented uh, sort of where we, how we got to where we are now and exactly where we're at in the negotiations very well. So I don't want to, you know, sort of repeat um, Negar's points. I will add a couple things. Um, so one of the differences between the negotiations right now versus 2015 is in 2015, the US and Iran had direct negotiations. Right now, the negotiations are indirect. And the reason for that is that the United States has not returned to the deal, right? So it's upon Iran's insistence that the US not be allowed to participate directly. But that insistence is because the Biden administration has not actually returned to the deal. And the reason I point that out is because it was a very easy thing for the Biden admin to do. Just like on day one, uh, last year when they came in and said, you know, we're rescinding the Muslim ban, we're returning to the Paris Accord, very easily it was up to this administration to do so. And so Negar pointed to the idea that there was, you know, slow moving and delays and uh, in of this administration in addressing this issue. But one of the early missteps was simply not returning to the deal. Um, that didn't mean, in fact, that the U.S. had to lift sanctions. The U.S. could have left sanctions in place, but at least been a party to the deal, which it is currently not. So when we talk about restoration, we're not talking about two equal sides returning to a deal. Iran is in the deal. Iran doesn't have to return to it. The only party that has to return to it is the U.S. The issue of compliance applies to both the United States and Iran. So Iran has reduced its compliance with the deal, has to you know, uh, go back to the limitations set within the deal. Obviously, on the U.S. side, they have to lift sanctions. The other thing about lifting sanctions, though, which I thought was important to mention as well, is that the Biden as a candidate, um, not only did he criticize the Trump administration for its Iran policy, whether it was uh, quitting the deal, whether it was the assassination of General Soleimani, but in April of 2020, uh, Biden wrote a statement, or at least there's a statement released in his name, uh, that calls on the Trump administration specifically to address sanctions that are impeding the flow of essential and humanitarian goods into Iran. And in the statement, Biden says, that though there are humanitarian exemptions on paper, in reality, it's not happening. In reality, within a pandemic, uh, the, the flow of essential goods is being uh, slowed and actually just completely stopped because of US sanctions. So it's interesting to me that now, you know, nearly two years ago, the President Biden called for the Trump administration to take immediate steps. And now a year into office, more than a year into office, he's yet to do the same thing. So there's two separate issues that, that I think, um, especially for the audience that we have here is important to realize is that not only 
did we never return to the to the deal? And have we taken a sort of, uh, and by we, I mean, obviously the US government, have we taken a sort of um, hardline position ourselves? Um, but also we're not addressing secondary issues, which are sanctions that hurt the humanitarian flow in a pandemic. That should never be something that is conflated with the issue of uh, a conflict, with the issue of uh, a nuclear, nuclear proliferation. And that is something that Biden himself said. So there are frustrations dealing with the fact that this admin has not come in and dealt with the situation in a terribly different way than their predecessors. And on that note, I'll say one more thing. It is the way that the issue is being framed uh, and, and parroted often in US media on the US side is that the onus is on Iran. You know, Iran has to return to compliance. At the beginning, it was you know, flat out, Iran has to return to compliance and then we'll lift sanctions. Now, you know, uh, they, the Biden admin sort of left that posture, but still is, is engaged in this political posturing that consistently makes it sound like, you know, the, the choice is with Iran. It's the ball is in Iran's court. And there's something that is not totally honest about that, which is we don't lack agency. The US government has a lot of agency. The Biden administration without Congress, without anything else, has the agency to change the course of events. And thus far, it has chosen not to. And even though we're engaged in negotiations, the nature of negotiations, the nature of diplomacy is how you talk to people. It's how you communicate with people. And we are communicating an obstinate refusal to lift sanctions. And we're doing so as if the Trump admin never happened, as if Iran is not in a position, rightfully so, to say, we don't trust the US because the US is the one who reneged on the deal. And while it may not have been President Biden, while it may not have been the Biden administration, it was the United States of America. And it doesn't matter who was in power. This occurred, this happened. By the way, in three years, Trump can become president of the US again. So we have to be able to understand within the frame of negotiations how the other side, whether the other side is our friend or our adversary, is thinking about how to approach a negotiation. So one of the impediments on the Iranian side is obviously this notion of guarantees. Now, while the Biden admin can't guarantee what a next administration will do, and it certainly can't legally do so, um, there can be at least some verifying mechanism in place just the way that there is for Iran, right? The, the original deal was, was built in a way where the, the clear idea was the mistrust is on Iran. So there has to be mechanisms in place that verifies Iran's compliance and punishes Iran if they don't comply. Of course, no other party, no other uh, party to the deal had the same verifications or the same, you know, mechanisms. And so the idea that Iran wants guarantees to make sure that there is actual tangible sanctions relief um, should also be something that we consider fairly reasonable in terms of negotiations that are within uh, the control of the Biden admin. Whether or not they control what happens after is a different question. Um, so those are things that I wanted to, to add to Nagar's comments. And the only other thing that I wanted to add before we sort of you know, pass it over for discussions and questions and whatnot is why, not just how, but why we end up in these situations with Iran. Um, because part of the topic that we're talking about today is, is broader US-Iran relations. Um, I'll refer to a report that I actually just recently wrote and was released um, two weeks ago uh, called Othering Iran, How Dehumanization of Iranians Undermines Rights at Home. And the crux of the argument, the crux of the research is to say, it is extraordinarily easy in the US uh, for an American politician to simply dismiss Iran or talk about Iran in a way um, that is politically loaded, that is different than maybe other topics. Uh, and the reason why that's important is it impacts the way that we approach policy. Iran has been systematically demonized for decades in the US. And there's a historical precedent for all of that. And obviously, we don't have time for me to get into every detail, but that's what the report's for. So the report gets into the details of that history, um, into how US popular culture, media, and politicians have consistently sort of dehumanized uh, Iranians and by extension, Americans like me who are of Iranian heritage, right? We undermine the rights of Americans at home. I'm an American, Hania is an American. The fact that we're of Iranian heritage does not mean that we are deserving of less rights. It does not mean that we should be questioned at the border um, because of our Iranian heritage. It doesn't mean that our families should be banned from visiting us because of our country of heritage. And yet these are the ways that our community is impacted. 
Beyond that, our foreign policy is impacted by this sort of blind spot. So what was the issue with Biden? Why didn't he just return to the deal and lift the sanctions and have Iran return to comply? Like, this was actually not a difficult task. What made it difficult was a political atmosphere in which even before, he has not lifted sanctions, but you have Republicans straight out lying that Biden has lifted all sanctions on Iran. Look at all of his concessions on Iran. None of these things have happened. And yet you have opponents of the deal spreading misinformation intentionally, all because it is so easy to use Iran as this caricature of a villain. And this has been that process of dehumanization. When you dehumanize people, and this is not unique to Iran, uh, this exists in our domestic politics, certainly when you look at uh, the issues of race and systemic racism in the United States, there's, it works through dehumanization. And it, and it, it is an issue uh, well beyond policies that we have with Iran. It is part of our foreign policy, whether it's Islamophobia, whether it's um, anti-Arab, anti-Iranian, all of these sentiments play into uh, the way that we go about our foreign policy. Um, dare I say, white supremacy has something to do with it, right? So it's not just a domestic issue. The foreign and domestic are connected in that way. And so the intention of the report was simply to say that until we recognize this, until we at least acknowledge it, until we understand that the way that we are uh, implementing policy has much less to do with like rational reasoning, with actual U.S. objectives. I mean, this is this is the clear point. It is within the interest of the United States, as well as the global community, as well as Iran, to return to this deal. There's no question about that. Every almost everyone, almost the entire global community, has agreed upon this, um, and yet we're having such a difficult time doing it. Biden could have done it and yet he didn't because it takes political will. It takes political courage to stand up to an atmosphere where one country and one group of people has been vilified to such an extent that you can starve them with sanctions in the middle of a pandemic and no one bats an eye because it is okay to be anti-Iran. It is okay to make wildly Racist comments about Iranians, like when you have someone like Wendy Sherman say that deception is in their DNA, or you have Lindsey Graham say things like, jokingly say, it would be terrible if my DNA turned out to have any Iranian heritage in it. These are, these are comments that imply that Iranian heritage and Iranian blood is somehow tainted. That is nothing but racist. And the fact that we can make those comments, the fact that politicians can make these comments with almost no backlash, is because of that system and that process of dehumanization and the atmosphere that is created. So in order to actually have rational policies when it comes to Iran, first we have to recognize that rather than just pointing the finger at the fanaticism that we see from their government, which certainly exists, we have to recognize our own. And our own is the fact that we undermine our own objectives and policies. We watch as other states, such as Israel, undermine our objectives and we do nothing about it. And instead of say, criticizing Israel when it assassinates an Iranian scientist illegally or attacks an Iranian nuclear site illegally. Who do we show our anger towards? Iran for reacting to those incidents, for saying, okay, now we're going to enrich more because we've been attacked. What is the reaction of the United States government? It is to condemn Iran and to say nothing about Israel. Those are outside of a sort of fanatic way of looking at how we create alliances, there's no logic behind it. It's not based on international law. It's not based on rules or order. It is based on saying one person, one group, one country is bad and another one is good, no matter their actions. And that's simply not a way to create rational foreign policy, which is why we often don't. So that's my contribution to this conversation. Uh, thank you. I could I could listen to you both um, for hours. Um, so thank you so much, Asad. Before I hand it to uh, Brian to go to our first call to action, um, I just wanted to add to something that you said about you know hurting the, the sanctions. The longer these JCPOA talks uh, talks go on, the, the more Iranians are are are, are being impacted uh, under sanctions and. What we've seen time and time and time again is that the US government and its allies, they continue to kind of manipulate the value of women's rights, right? To justify the sanctions in uh, countries that they um, want to either, uh, you know, um, occupy or, or, or control in, in some way, shape or form. But um, Ryan, I will hand it off to you um, before we go to Q&A and uh, we'll go to first call to action. 
Sure. And, and this is a really easy action that all of you can take. And uh, Asal, you, you said it very well. What's missing right now from this situation is the political courage and the po political will. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to get out and push. Because that's that, that's what's going to make the Biden administration take action. The reason why we didn't get back into the deal uh, is because of domestic considerations, uh, because the Biden administration, despite the fact that on the campaign trail, they said that they would return to the JCPOA as negotiated and without preconditions. Biden said that himself while he campaigned for president. I know it's it's one of the reasons why a, a lot of people voted for. So what we need to do right now is tell our members of Congress as well, and the president and his administration, the secretary of state, the secretary of defense, uh, that we want a return to this deal. We simply want what was promised on the campaign trail. And it's going to be better for US security. It's gonna be better for the security of the region. Um, Nagar was, was saying what a rare and important achievement this is, and she's absolutely right. Uh, just to, just to, to reinforce what she said, this is a deal that the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, China, Iran, and the United States agreed on. How rare is that? <laughs> and we pulled out of it. You know, the Biden administration is always talking about international norms and a rules-based order. We're the ones who are breaking the rules here. We, we are the ones that have departed from the norm <laughs> when, when we abandon a, a deal like this that was indeed one, one of the finest achievements of the Obama administration. Um, so please, uh, Shay, uh, if you could put that link in the chat again, this is really, really easy to do. Um, you just click it and you just fill out your address and it automatically sets up a letter to the Biden administration, his secretary of state, his secretary of defense, and your members of Congress saying that you support this deal. And for you, it's a voting issue. So take an action. Nagar and Asal, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it back to you for questions, but they have armed us with a lot of knowledge and they're going to continue to do so. But if we don't take action, we're wasting that. So honor what they've done for us, what they're doing for us tonight. Uh, you know, use that knowledge uh, and make a demand. Uh, and with that, I, I wanna get to your great questions. I think I'm gonna hand it back over to Mark. Oh, okay, so Brian, you are, so is there a link that you want people to click on? Yep, uh, it's right there in the chat and, uh, Shay, if you can put it there again, I think you made a nice bit.ly link uh, as well. Uh, it's bit.ly slash uh, save the deal email. It's right there in the chat. You can click that. It, it takes a minute, maybe okay. even less. Yeah. So Thank you. I see it right there. That's terrific. Yeah. Usually we put it on the screen, but then you can't click on the link and people get a little frustrated. So please just visit the chat, click on the link. Fill out, there's a form to fill out. And, uh, and that's, that's our action. That's our first action. Okay. Thanks so much, Brian. Anya. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Brian. Um, so let's kind of dig in and let's, let's ask some questions. I see so many wonderful questions uh, in the chat, which Medea and I will kind of go back and forth and ask. Um, but uh, Asal and, uh, and, and Nagar, you know, we kind of talked about how this is such a celebratory uh, you know, moment uh, if both countries in fact do end up uh, uh, coming to an agreement um, uh, on JCPOA, but Robert Malley is finding himself a bit alone here, right? And, and, and can we, Negar, talk about why this is happening? Sure, Hania. Thank you, Brian, to those excellent comments. I just want uh, sort of a disclaimer uh, to some of my previous comments that Iran does have problematic foreign policy and certain regional policies, certain uh, presences across the region um, that it's not only the US, but US allies, the Europeans also take issue with. But when it comes, and, and we don't disagree with that also, domestic repression, 
um, the abuse of human rights in various areas, the crushing of the civil society, of peaceful protests and all of that. But on this nuclear deal, on this very historic agreement, as Brian also mentioned, and against what was expected, despite what was expected right after the JCPOA, there was all this talk from, again, critics of diplomacy that Iran is going to cheat, Iran is not going to abide by this deal, they're going to sign and go uh, turn around and do something again. They stuck to their commitments under the deal. And again, as Brian uh, very well explained, it was the United States who pulled out of the deal for no reason, um, for no violation from the other side. And in fact, the Iranian state in the deal, in full commitment to the deal, even after President Trump pulled out for um, a long while, and then they started reducing compliance. But going to your important question, Hanya, there's been some public reporting and also some behind the scenes talks. It seems like a few members of the negotiating team um, have sort of went back to the State Department to other positions and are no longer part of the team. There was some reporting in the Wall Street Journal and some other um, outlets. And there was this sort of this intonation that it, it, was, it was coming out of personal disagreements. But my understanding is that it's more of a big picture um, uh, and policy disagreements. So basically, Robert Malley, yes, he's the special envoy on Iran. He's the chief negotiator on the US side, but he's not implementing his own personal decisions. Um, he's implementing the decisions of the president. These decisions are made in the White House, and he's basically the diplomat relaying back and forth. And that's why all the diplomats have left Vienna. There's a break in the eighth round. They're uh, going back to their capitals to sort of consult and take direction. So the, whatever the dis disagreements were, and we don't have exact details, but um, it was with the policy that's being implemented from the White House and with the support of the president himself. And that's why, again, going back to my initial remarks, it's important that President Biden puts his political support behind this because it's an issue that's very sensitive in Washington, in the US. It has many critics. It has many powerful critics. Just as we were talking, Senator Menendez was criticizing a return to the JCPOA as it exists. Um, so it needs the full support of the president, some spending of political capital. But um, on this issue of personnel changes, first of all, it's not unusual, but um, I think it, the disagreement has been with policy. And again, this goes back to sort of a cautious optimism that I have that a potential outcome may be in sight. Thank you, uh, Nagar. And, uh... Asad, did you also want to add to this or should we move on to Midia's question? I think Negar answered it very well, so I think we should move on to the next question. Great, uh, and Medea, please take it away. Uh, yes, there are so many wonderful questions. One series of questions seems to be about the sanctions themselves. Um, well, first, is it the same deal or have there been changes to the original deal? Uh, the sanctions, uh, our understanding is that there are sanctions that are separate from the JCOP, uh, JCPOA. Will they continue to be in place? And how uh, biting are those sanctions? Will the Iranian people start to feel relief from some of these sanctions in relatively short term? When? Um, and then there have been questions related to that. Does this mean that Iran will be able to be back in the uh, international banking system? And how much during this time of the sanctions have they circumvented that? Um, and uh, will that continue as well uh, for Iran to have an economy that is less dependent on the West? So maybe we could start with the Sal for that. Sure. I mean that that had a lot of parts, but we'll yeah. I'll say I'll say this about um, how the sanctions are being approached, at least when you listen to the Biden team and how they talk about it. So. One of the things that the Trump administration did, and they did so intentionally um, at the behest of, you know, think tankers who thought, who didn't want the deal, opponents of the deal, wasn't just that the Biden admin put, I mean, sorry, the Trump admin put a series of sanctions or reimposed a series of sanctions, but they intentionally tried to make it difficult for the Biden admin to reverse those sanctions. How did they do this? Um, they double and triple sanctioned the same entities. So what happens is with the JCPOA, 
there are nuclear sanctions. And so the nuclear sanctions must be lifted, right? And that's why the, the Biden administration has talked about it as sanctions that are inconsistent with the deal. That phrase has been used by different members of the admin. Sanctions that are inconsistent with the deal will have to be lifted clearly because that would be the US holding up its end of the deal. But for instance, say something like the Central Bank of Iran. Um, if it got sanctioned under the Trump administration under uh, nuclear sanctions, it also got sanctioned under, say, terrorist sanctions. And so what does that do? The reason it makes it difficult for the Biden admin is because now the backlash will be, oh, but you're lifting terrorist sanctions. But of course, this was an intentional path taken, what was called the sanctions wall. And the reason why was to make it impossible for a next administration to return to the deal. Um, so it really had nothing to do with the, the implementing of the sanctions had nothing to do with why those entities were uh, under pressure besides to make it impossible to return to the deal. Now, the, the phrasing I think is actually quite important by saying sanctions that are inconsistent with the deal would have to be lifted. Um, that's not all US sanctions, right? Um, first of all, the US never lifted all sanctions, but sanctions that went after, and because the Obama admin made it, created tougher sanctions on Iran, um, which they boasted about at the time as well, uh, using phrases like crippling sanctions or how much, you know, how, how the, much inflation it has caused, how much it's actually, it was hurting um, Iranian people even then. But that compared to maximum pressure under Trump is uh, quite a different ballgame. Uh, Trump's max maximum pressure decimated the Iranian middle class. I and mean, you have millions of people um, who were forced into poverty. And, and no less so because a lot of that time was spent in a pandemic, which, you know, we don't have to look far. We're the richest, most powerful country in the world. And yet we have felt, at least ordinary Americans, not billionaires, have felt the impact of the pandemic um, in our own lives. So imagine now adding to that being the most sanctioned country in the world by far, which is Iran. So it, for in order for the Biden admin to lift sanctions that are inconsistent, it would have to lift the sanctions that are suffocating Iran's basically entire financial sector. Um, it would have to allow for uh, oil sales. It, it would have to do something where it didn't have to lift every single American sanction. Um, but for instance, targeted sanctions on human rights abusers, individuals in the uh, in the Iranian government who are um, who are human rights abusers who have committed human rights uh, violations. If they are individually sanctioned, there's no reason why those sanctions can't stay in place. But that is not the same thing as blanket sanctions that make it impossible for any business, any investment, any just a basic transaction, right? That's the problem right now. The problem is no bank will administer a transaction for fear of violating US sanctions. That means even medicine, right? That means nothing. They just won't do it. So so there's, you know, we can, and there's a whole debate about how sanctions can be used as a tool. Um, but this is not, this is not targeted. This is this is very intentionally and knowingly. Remember that statement I mentioned about Biden, knowing that it goes as far as essential goods, we have maintained all of them in place. And so there's definitely a lot of space that if those sanctions were in fact lifted um, and there were certain guarantees made to businesses that if they invested in Iran, they would not be um, they would not be punished for doing so, then that would be a huge you know, breath of oxygen to the Iranian economy and could help Iranian people, certainly. Negar, is there anything in all those questions that you wanted to add? Sure. Um, as Asan mentioned, basically, the Trump administration has created a minefield for the Biden administration to specifically prevent them from returning the reimposed sanctions. And the web of sanctions pretty much are designed in a way that make it very difficult because the Iranian side, their, their experience with the JCPOA in 2015 was that despite the lifting of whatever sanctions that were lifted back then, they didn't see so much of the economic return uh, that they wanted. Even European companies and banks uh, were afraid, continue to be afraid, even after the JCPOA and the lifting of sanctions, they were afraid of doing business with Iran for the fear of losing the bigger market, which is the United States. And then after the withdrawal for the, from the JCPOA, it was just um, complete lack of economic uh, return under the deal. And now the Iranian side is asking for meaningful and verifiable sanctions uh, relief. So how, I know there are some questions about the details of what kind of sanctions will be lifted and what this will look like. 
we don't have those details. We won't know the diplomats are holding their cards very, very close to their chest and nothing basically is agreed until everything is agreed as the diplomats always say. But we know that the Iranian side is um, serious about um, getting this kind of sanctions relief and maybe in the form of comfort letters from the United States, from OFAC, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, the Treasury Department to certain banks, certain companies in Europe and Asia uh, to assure them of uh, being able to do business with Iran. Um, we don't know the exact details, but the Iranian side is very serious about um, this verifiable relief and also the economic returns. Um, and uh, there was another uh, question about Iran media. I believe you wrote that about Iran-Saudi relations. I think that's a, a sort of interesting um, point about this administration, this conservative administration of Ibrahim Raisi, the new foreign minister who also is a conservative himself, Hussein Amir Abdullahian, um, and has been in the foreign ministry for a, for a long time. He is actually an expert on Iran's relations with the Arab world that had been his role as a deputy in the foreign ministry. And it seems like that's the one area that there may be surprisingly some development in Iran, the outreach to Saudi Arabia and the willingness on the other side, on the Saudi, Emirati, the countries of the Persian Gulf to sort of engage with Iran and reduce tension. So I wouldn't be surprised um, if we see some positive developments there as far as the region itself trying to reduce tension in a form of dialogue, uh, which obviously didn't happen under President Trump because Saudi Arabia and um, Emirates had the full support um, of the U.S. and uh, were more emboldened when it came to their opposition to Iran. But with the Biden administration, I think that sort of carte blanche um, of, of the Trump administration no longer exists. And there's also the feeling on the other side, uh, not just on Iran's side, that maybe there needs to be more engagement and outreach. So I think there, there's been uh, multiple rounds of engagements with Saudi Arabia, and um, there might be some positive news there within this administration. And in general, I think we're going to see more of a shift to the region and to towards the east um, with this new administration in Iran, as opposed to the previous moderate administration that had more of a, an outlook, at least, to the west, especially they were really looking forward to doing business and trade with Europe, which didn't happen even after the JCPOA. So just to wrap up on that regional um, thing, Nagar, could you say a word about Israel? Is this considered a loss for Israel or did Israel get something out of uh, the US getting back into the deal? Well, the general consensus of the Israeli intelligence um, apparatus, even back then during the Obama time, even though there was very public and political um, pushback to the negotiations and the deal by former Prime Minister Netanyahu, the intelligence community and the security community concluded that the JCPOA was actually a benefit in within um, the national security benefits of Israel because it was the best way to put a limit and monitoring and verification on Iran's nuclear program. And now we're hearing more criticism um, from Israeli officials, some uh, former officials of the, uh, of the Netanyahu government criticizing his support uh, and push for President Trump to withdraw from the JCPOA. And we also heard that criticism on the Senate floor from uh, Senator Menendez. So those who push President Trump to pull out of the JCPOA, hoping for a better, stronger, longer deal, or the sort of 12 demands that Secretary Pompeo had put on for Iran and achieved none, um, are I think are, we're hearing more criticism. And a lot of them are coming from different circles in Israel, and surprisingly, some former officials of the Netanyahu government. So I think a return to the JCPOA would be um, not politically speaking, but from a security and nuclear perspective, it would be to Israel's uh, benefit as far as security, because it's essentially what is the JCPOA? The JCPOA is an agreement to convince Iran to put monitoring, um, the most rigorous monitoring uh, structure on its nuclear program and ensure that it remains civilian. So I think it's good for everyone in the region, but 
obviously also for Israel. Can I add something? I just wanted to add because we're talking about Israel uh, and Nagar said that uh, a deal would be in terms of like the security of the region, stability of the region, it would be it would be best because what do we think? We think non-proliferation is, is the best way um, to deal with sort of the weapons world that we exist in. Now, something interesting when we talk about Israel and you always have to remind everybody, Israel is a nuclear power, but nobody will acknowledge it, including the United States. And the reason why that's important is because Iran entertains the idea, would support the idea of if you actually believe in non-proliferation, then the Middle East should be a nuclear-free zone, which Iran supports, as do basically most of the countries in the region. Guess who doesn't support that? The United States and Israel. So the problem becomes this double speak where we state an objective, but none of our policies actually fulfill that objective. So it's not a question of nuclear weapons are bad and we don't want anybody to have them. So we want to make sure that Israel has an advantage and that no one else has them. And again, we cannot, as long as we, the United States, as the most powerful country in the world, continues to um, not act as an even-handed broker in any of these issues, it means we have no credibility in dealing with them. But Iran is willing, um, has clearly shown that it is willing to have oversight of its nuclear program. It's a signatory to the NPT, to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and that should not be missed. What, and I think the reason why I wanted to say it is what Negar said is so important. What is the JCPOA? The JCPOA is a non-proliferation agreement. And it is, according to experts in that field, the strongest one historically. So that should be something that we not only celebrated, but that we built on and expanded into other areas of the region. Instead, we've done nothing but undermine it over and over again. That's, uh, that's extremely important. And, and we'll wrap it up with this uh, next question here, which will be uh, for both of you to, to, to respond. Uh, we've been sharing a ton of uh, links in the chat and uh, one would be um, uh, Dr. Rod's article, recent article that just came out, Roots Action through Progressive Hub has uh, um, also published an article on JCPOA. It's written by myself and uh, my colleague, uh, Charles Lankner, as well as I do urge um, for our Iranian American woman here on this call um, to sign the statement urging the Biden administration to join the JCPOA, uh, as well as if you know anyone um, in your network, please do share the statement because we would love to have your support. Um, and, and we'll share that in the, in the chat shortly. But just to kind of wrap it up and sum it up, um, this has come up a couple of times in the chat. Uh, House Foreign Affairs uh, Committee is holding an expert briefing on the Iran nuclear deal on, uh, or Iran's nuclear threat um, on Friday. Uh, how should we try and influence the line of questioning? What are the important questions for pro-JCPOA members to ask? Any of you, if you could. Uh, yeah. Asa, do you want to go first? Connie, can you repeat the question actually? Absolutely. Um, so what, for people who are attending this call, who um, we've taken action, obviously, how can we influence Congress? How do we take action? How do we say enough is enough, right? And um, also that there's that hearing that you mentioned uh, on Friday. Friday. Correct. Yeah, well, I mean, in, in general, I think the, the idea is to uh, pressure our politicians, obviously, there's there's what the individuals can do and then there's what organizations can do um and we right now on this call represent multiple organizations right so um i think a coalition of organizations peace activists pro-diplomacy voices um anti-sanctions voices i mean this goes across different sort of elements of uh advocacy work that people do is really we need pressure on the administration to act and that pressure is as simple as the action that brian shared calling your representative, um, having meetings with your representatives, with your senators, and say, because one of the issues that exists, remember we said it's just political will. The Biden admin has to know that they at least have the support of their own government, right? Their own Congress. And so that's where we need to put pressure as well as on the administration itself. I think one of the um, issues in my view has been that a lot of people, uh, who are supporters of Biden sometimes have a difficult time criticizing him, uh, which is odd because I always think that that's the nature of a democracy, right? If you voted for Biden, if you helped fundraise for him, if you told other people to vote for him, if you did anything where you actually supported this administration, that's precisely who this administration should be answering to, 
right? I actually think that we should be, if you are the supporters of one admin, then that is the one that you should put more pressure on because they are, um, they are more likely, or at least should be more likely to respond to it. Because for instance, why would a Trump admin, probably many of the people on this call were not necessarily Trump supporters. Why would they listen to a group of people who don't vote or support them? This admin has to. That is how they're going to get reelected if that's the intention. And sometimes I question uh, at times for this first year what the intention of this admin is, but we need to put pressure on them. And I think it's, it's about, you know, not sort of, um, being nervous to criticize them as if that's going to hurt the chances of them being elected in three years. But what will help them get elected is if we actually put the pressure on to carry out the policies that the people who, the 80 plus million people who voted for him uh, wanted to see happen. And, and I will point this specific statistic out, poll after poll has shown that the majority of Americans, a bipartisan majority of Americans agree with the deal and want the issue with Iran resolved in a diplomatic fashion through negotiations. So it is odd to me that we that this government, if it is indeed a democratic government, would even entertain any other option when that is the will of the people, bipartisan. I have to say this, I have to emphasize this. The majority of Republicans think the same thing. It's a much larger majority on the Democrat side. But nonetheless, there has to be um, that pressure from those voters in order for that to happen. Thank you so much, Saul Rod of the National Iranian American Council, NIAC, and also, uh, excuse, uh, yes, and Nagar Mortazavi, uh, host of the Iran podcast, journalist, author. It's our great pleasure to host you tonight. And at this point, before we go into the second action that Brian's going to lead us in, uh, please unmute and thank our guests. Everybody can unmute and thank. Yes, thank you. <laughs> No thank, you. thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. It was very useful. Thank you. 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 All right. At this point, we're going to now. <laughs> We're now going to go to Brian Garvey, back to Brian, because we have a second action. We want to make sure that we take action after hearing these very motivating, motivating speaks, speakers tell us uh, what the lay of the land is. So, Brian, yes, what's next? Thanks. And, you know, like Marcy just said, and I think everybody recognizes uh, Asal Nagar, that was absolutely brilliant. And what you've done is you've, you've armed us with the knowledge that we need and the motivation to take action, right? You can see it in the news today. The Iran nuclear deal is, is on, on the front pages. It's being considered right now. The political calculus is happening and we can change that math. Um, so 136 of us have taken action um, so if you can put that uh, link uh, in the chat once more, uh, I'm just going to go through it really quick because it's, it's so easy. Uh, and so there's about 70 of us left uh, who, who can take that action. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. You can see you just click the link and it goes here and you just fill out your information. And uh, uh, this, this link will allow you to make a public statement for those who are using Twitter. Um, if you're signed into Twitter, uh, you can make a statement to all of these folks, to the president, to your senators. You got my senators here in Massachusetts, my representative who's in a leadership role, um, uh, and also the secretary of state and the secretary of defense. And you can tweet these people directly. It's so easy. Right? Two clicks. I just sent a message to the President of the United States. Right? And we know how vain politicians are. Uh, they care about their mentions uh, on Twitter, on social media. It, and it's that easy. All it takes is three clicks. Click in the chat, uh, what Shay is putting in right now. Uh, to the to the social media uh, uh, portion of this, and I'm just going to send a, a message to Ed Markey, right? Just going to click him. 
And Brian, if That's somebody it. is not on Twitter, they can do the first action. Right yeah, now. sure. So let's take another look at that one, right? Because not everybody's taken that action yet. I can understand. I mean, uh, Asal and, and Nagar and, and Hanya and your questions were very compelling. So maybe you were just really focused on that. I, I couldn't blame you. Um, but if you click that first link, it's, it's incredibly similar, right? You just put your information in here, click next. Oh, sorry, I, I got the wrong, I got the wrong link myself. Um, but it's that first one, it's save the deal. Uh, and let me just share again. The second one. So the second one was for those who are on Twitter, the first the one. Second, yeah, we're going back to the first one, bro, because not everybody's on Twitter, right? Uh, the Twitter is good because it's public. It's a public ask. Uh, so it's it's mounting pressure that's not just behind the scenes, it's out there in the open. Um, but the first action, it just generates a message, right? That talks about the uh, importance of the deal and the promise to rejoin it. And you know, wh where are you at a year into this? Um, we expect you to do what you campaigned on. You know, this is not a difficult ask that we're making. Uh, and, and also, it was mentioned before, you know, this is one of the crowning achievements of the Obama administration, one of the biggest achievements of the president's former boss. You know, so there are people in that administration like John Kerry, right? This was a great achievement of his who I'm sure wants the JCPOA restored because that's a feather in his cap, right? So what, what we need right now is just to a push, right? Because there are people in the administration that have been dragging their feet. And there are people in the administration that want us to get back in this deal. Um, and we need to be on the right side. Um, Nagar was right. Um, and, and you'll hear this criticism as a peace activist. I'm sure many of you have heard it before. Um, you know, support for the JCPOA does not mean we're making the government of Iran a paragon of virtue. That is not what we're doing here. What we're doing is promoting diplomacy, uh, trying, to, trying to make US-Iran relations normal again. And that's gonna improve the situation uh, for the people all across the region uh, uh, for, for Iranian citizens, it's going to improve life for U.S. citizens, uh, especially those of Iranian descent who do face a lot of awful and disgusting uh, racism because of our uh, uh, horrible foreign policy against Iran. So let that motivate you. Take these actions. Um, and, you know, I think that we can get over 200 over 200 messages sent by the end of this. I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, and, you know, you, you have this knowledge, you've heard how important this is. So do something about it. You know, Thank take you, Ryan. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, and as long as we're making some pitches, I would just like to encourage people to join the Code Pink Congress Google group because that's where we issue a lot of our action alerts, you know, the kind of urgent ones, last minute action alerts. And to do that, Shay will post the link in the chat and also want to make a pitch for Code Pink Congress liaisons. We have about 75, there are 435 congressional districts. So we have a ways to go, but we're, we're off to a great start and we want more of you to join us because as us all said, it's supposed to be the people's house, right? Uh, the Biden administration, they, needs, they need your votes. Uh, it's incredibly important that, that we weigh in. All right, with that, uh, let's go to Cole uh, to introduce our next speaker on video. Uh, yes, just briefly, uh, Senator Markey, Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts has uh, made a video with his thoughts. On, you know, he has been a consistent supporter of returning to the Iran deal. Uh, you know, and he would be the first to say that he has criticisms of Iran and so on, but he has, you know, th throughout this process been a strong supporter of the deal. So he, he's just made us a video to give us his current assessment. Uh, I think, Shay, are you going to show that? There we go. Hello, I'm Senator Red Markey. It's Massachusetts oh. Peace Action and Code Pink to support diplomacy with Iran. In the first weeks of the Biden administration, I reintroduced my Iran Diplomacy Act. It backs the Biden administration's efforts to return the United States to the Iran nuclear deal, 
provided Iran also comes back into full compliance with its nonproliferation commitments. Diplomacy works. The proof is that by the time that President Obama left office, the Iran nuclear deal had lengthened the time required for Iran to acquire enough nuclear material for a bomb from weeks to a full year. The deal eliminated 98% of Iran's stock of enriched uranium and cut off its plutonium pathway to a nuclear weapon. And it put into place the most intrusive verification measures ever negotiated in a non-proliferation agreement. So sorry, all video stalling, let me give it a moment. While we're stalling, I just want to uh, give a little promo for the Iran podcast. Nagar is the host of that, and uh, you heard her tonight. She's terrific. So the Iran podcast. Great. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry, everyone. I'll say this will come right back up. Uh, and <laughs> maybe we have some people signing up for Code Pink Congress to be a Code Pink Congress liaison and to join our Google group. Uh, that would be fantastic. So we can uh, better communicate with you. And uh, well, until he starts talking. Right. Right. It the is the gold standard. In short, the Iran nuclear deal was working. It prevented war and a bomb. But that did not stop President Trump and John Bolton from blowing up the deal in 2018 and reimposing nuclear related sanctions. Trump's unilateral decision lifted the lid that the world placed on Iran's nuclear program and raised U.S. tensions with Tehran, bringing us perilously close to a war on two occasions. Since the U.S. exit from the nuclear deal, Iran has taken several concerning steps to increase its stock of nuclear material, and it has denied IAEA inspectors full access to declared and non-declared facilities. The best and the only durable way to prevent a nuclear Iran and a catastrophic war is through diplomacy. However, time is of the essence. All sides should return to their commitments under the Iran nuclear deal, and then we can work to address other areas of concern. Let me be clear. Military action will not prevent Iran from entering the nuclear weapons club. It is likely to spur it on. Only a negotiated agreement can move us beyond the dangerous status quo and aggressive Iran regionally that is also not abiding by the limits on its nuclear activities. Thank you again for your steadfast support for diplomacy. Together, we can shape a future that is defined by peace and not brinksmanship. You have always been leaders. Thank you for everything that you are doing. Let us continue to advocate for a peaceful resolution of all of these issues. Senator Ed Markey, certainly one of the best in the Senate. Thank you, Cole and Brian, for uh, having him record that video. Cole, any final thoughts? Or maybe you can share how people can learn more about Massachusetts Peace Action. Yeah, so th I just want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, we had a thorough discussion tonight, but there's probably even more questions. Uh, obviously, even when the Iran deal, if and when the Iran deal gets restored, that is not going to be the end of tension in the Middle East, that the United States still has many foreign policy mistakes to correct as, as it looks at the Middle East. And, you know, I could just start with Yemen and Syria. And so, um, you know, this is just one step in a journey, but it's a really important step and we really need to get over this hump. Uh, so please share the action page, have friends and uh, neighbors, um, family members take the action as well. Uh, Mass Peace Action has a couple of events coming up. Um, should have brought these right on my screen. Uh, uh, we too, along with Code Pink, are organizing actions on the Ukraine crisis this weekend. Uh, we already have actions in uh, Northampton, Greenfield, and Boston planned, and I think Providence. That's, that one's not directly mapped with another group. Um, we also have a webinar Thursday on the brink, understanding the Ukraine crises and paths towards a just peace um, with two scholars. Um, 
<coughs> Richard Sakwa from the University of Kent and Nina Khrushcheva, who is the granddaughter of the former premier at the new school. Uh, and they're gonna be interviewed by Joseph Gerson Thursday at 2 p.m. Um, and then we have, uh, next week, we have a webinar on nuclear power on Monday night. We have one on the Afghanistan financial crisis, uh, also Monday night, uh, with a uh, professor who is a member, who is a board member of the Afghan Central Bank. We have a webinar on missile defense with Subrata Ghoshroy on Wednesday the 9th. And then on February 12th, uh, we are doing a uh, the Veterans for Peace are doing a presentation on their nuclear posture review. They've written a detailed report on what the United States nuclear weapons policy should be. Uh, Saturday, February 12th in the afternoon. And so thank you all for coming. Uh, we appreciate it. The next in our series is gonna be on uh, the harassment of Palestinian activists in the United States on February 15th. That's the next in our four part series by Mass Peace Action Code Pink on Foreign Policy. And we will see you then. Thank you so much, Cole. And Hania, perhaps you can share with us what's happening with Roots Action. Roots Action is also co sponsoring this tonight. And you have a statement that you're circulating. We want to hear about that as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Marcy. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Brian. Um, as always, thank you. Marcy Winograd um, and Medea Benjamin and our beautiful speaker, and it's always an honor. Uh, so in addition to the statement that we have issued um, by Iranian American women on behalf of the suffering of the Iranian American um, population in Iran under sanctions, um, we are also leading a few other campaigns. One uh, is um, uh, to, to combat vaccine apartheid. And uh, we, as Roots Action, stand obviously in solidarity with the People's Vaccine Alliance and uh, their 80 members, including Public Citizen, Oxfam, the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS, the African Alliance, and the Global Justice Now, and calling pharmaceutical corporations and the world leaders to immediately share technical know-how with uh, qualified manufacturers throughout the world to facilitate scale-up production of billions more COVID-19 vaccine doses um, and, and ur to urgently boost supplies. Uh, also, I know that Norman Solomon uh, has been leading on the uh, abolishing of the ICBM uh, campaign, co-chaired by um, our beloved Dan's El Dan, Dan Ellsberg. Um, and uh, so we will be, um, I'll share this information with, uh, with everyone now. Please uh, visit rootsaction.org. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll put the websites in the chat as well as progressivehub.net to keep up with our most recent events. And if you haven't signed up to get our latest news and our events that we have coming up, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we can share that with you through the website. Uh, yeah, passing it back to Marcy. All right, terrific. I thank all of you for your participation. Our guests, Asal Rod, Nagar Murtazavi. Uh, I thank our co-sponsors, Code Pink, Massachusetts Peace Action, Roots Action, and our co-host tonight, Brian Garvey, Cole Harrison of MAPA, and Hania Jodad Barnes of Roots Action, Medea Benjamin, my, my wonderful colleague at Code Pink, and also Shay Labau, who does our tech, a big shout out and applause for Shay. She works so hard and she organizes the Code Pink Congress liaisons. And we want our liaisons uh, to be active on a number of fronts. One, to push our house reps to tell Biden, rejoin the deal, as we've been talking about, to say lift, uh, you know, unfreeze the assets for Afghanistan. We don't want starvation there, not occupation to starvation. We want somebody in the house. Is there someone in the house with the courage to introduce a Yemen war powers resolution? Come on. Uh, we are asking our reps, please ask your rep to do that. Do show up Saturday, uh, if you can, this Saturday, uh, during those uh, protests of Pelosi fast-tracking the weapons to Ukraine. No, we don't want a war with Russia. No, we don't want to throw gasoline on the fire. Codepink.org, you'll find out more about those protests. And we have one in LA planned in front of the federal building and I'll be there. I hope to see you if you're in LA. I hope, I hope you'll join us. Okay, with that, I'm going to say good night. Uh, I also want to thank John Douglas. I don't know if John's still with us, but he, he often plays music at the end of our show, and he's a very talented musician. Check him out on YouTube. Uh, thank you all, and we're going to give you a little time to say the chat, and then we'll say goodnight. It's 
three dots at the bottom of the screen. See you soon.